Okay, I want to look at um, specifically moisture content density and water activity as metrics that uh, inform roasting choices and other choices that roasters ought to be considering when they're thinking about things like storage and safety practices. And I'm going to pr uh, preview a little bit of early research on um, processing methods and some of the ways that those might be slightly um, reactive in the roaster to different uh, approaches. So let's start with moisture. Um, moisture content is uh, the way we describe the percentage of green coffee um, measured by weight. And as um, Dr. Uh, Artajo spoke about earlier, um, one of the uh, kind of stipulations based on international coffee organizations um, recommendations is that that typically is considered export ready when it's between 10 and 12 percent um, by weight. Um, and that's kind of been the industry standard for a very long time. Uh, I think that um, many of us are probably familiar who measure this metric of coffees that might um, find themselves outside of those ranges. I like to think of things in terms of like relative to what we typically see. And so this is kind of like my uh, spectrum of potential water um, moisture content uh, percentages in common green coffee readings, where I would consider um, about that 9% to be relatively low. Um, and I know that the ICO has kind of made a habit of uh, recommending against overly dried coffees in my very um, opinionated experience. I don't think that uh, extra dry coffees, as long as they taste good when you sample them, uh, are actually all that problematic. They're pretty stable in storage. And if they've been dried slowly, um, then it, theoretically, uh, they should be uh, tasting good for many, many months to come. Whereas coffees that potentially are on the wetter side are the ones that I would consider riskier for storage, storage uh, and shipping and shelf life. Uh, personally, I like coffees between about nine and a half percent and eleven and a half percent as a roaster. They're easy to work with. They're predictable, and again, they're great for shelf storage. Um, one of the most important things to consider when we're talking about moisture content is percentage of loss in the roaster, uh, and this is important for roasters in a very uh, measurable way financially. Um, basically, moisture content has a direct impact on how much coffee is left by weight after we're done roasting it. Um, and that percentage roughly corresponds to the same percentage that we find at the end of the roast. Now we know that coffee retains some moisture as it roasts, even past first crack and up to second crack, about one or 2% by the time we get to second crack, perhaps close to four or 5% at first crack and maybe a little bit more depending on the coffee. Um, and we know that the Maillard reactions do generate some water um, as they are undergoing during the earlier stages of roasting during color change. Um, but what we can also infer is that wetter coffees that start off with higher moisture contents green will lose a higher percentage of their total weight by the end of the roast. And that again has implications for roasters. If we take this sort of example hypothetically using some relatively easy numbers to parse. If we pretend that in our inventories, there's a Kenya with relatively low moisture percentage at 9% and a Sumatra with relatively high moisture percentage at 13%, then that 4% difference is reflected in our total weight uh, at the end of roasting. Even though the green weight is the same, the water weight as a 4% increase in Sumatran, in this example of Sumatran coffee, um, results in essentially what might be considered a value loss uh, as it roasts away um, during our typical production day. You know, if that pallet of 10 bags of each of these coffees, um, you know, cost us, um, let's say, I can't remember what my dollar figure is here, let's say $3 a pound perhaps, and our roasted dollar figure you know, if we're retailing that coffee at say $20 a pound, that's over a thousand dollars in difference of product if they're roasted to the same roast degree. So something to consider, um, not necessarily discouraging roasters from using higher moisture content coffees, particularly if they're delicious, but consider that 
um, that results in product loss. And that might be something that you may need to make up for when you're considering the differential between your green coffee value and your roasted coffee value and potentially even your retail pricing. Uh, and this is the slide where I get to disagree with Scott Rayo. Um, I enjoyed uh, Mr. Rayo's um, presentation earlier today very much, and I thought that he had a lot of great things to say. At the end, during the Q&A, there was a question about charge temperatures, and uh, Scott emphasized um, the importance of between batch protocols, that is maintaining a consistent between batch temperature, time, et cetera, um, during our roasting, between our roasting processes. And I totally agree with that. I think that's a really important part of a good consistent roasting protocols. Uh, during that Q&A, Marcus posed the question of whether or not charge temperature was relevant. And Scott's answer was no, if the between batch protocols are the same, then the charge temperature doesn't matter. And I totally disagree with that. Charge temperature is gonna have an impact on turnaround temperature and the total energy of the system. If those between batch protocols are maintained consistently, charge temperature absolutely matters. If the between batch protocols are different, that's when the charge temperature is irrelevant. Uh, so in this case, my suggestion uh, based on some experience is that coffees with higher moisture content tend to perform differently and one of those um, uh, differentials might be the way that they react to heat early in the roast. And we see this in this graph where a coffee was roasted against a profile and it had a different reaction to the same between batch protocols and the same charge temperature in that it took longer to turn around uh, during what we would traditionally call the drying phase, even though we know it's not fully dry by the time we exit the drying phase. Um, as a result, the coffee begins to pick up more momentum during Maillard reactions. Maillard is generating moisture, but it also uses moisture as momentum builder. So higher moisture content coffees and especially higher water activity coffees tend to race through those Maillard reactions at a higher uh, rate. Um, so one of the things that the roaster, I should say, um, could do in this case is first to lean into that longer uh, early stage of roasting, treat the coffees with higher moisture contents gently, potentially using a lower charge temperature to extend and lower that turning point. Um, and then also watch out for accelerated um, roasting strategy during the Maillard reactions. Uh, I would say that in many cases, trying to build some sort of balance in percentages or even extending the uh, Maillard reaction to a higher percentage of the total roasting time might be uh, relevant idea to try. Uh, the last thing that I would suggest is potentially trading a few seconds into um, the Maillard reactions out of your post-crack development. And the reason for that is um, that generally speaking, you're gonna be trying to get that coffee to behave like a normal, uh, normally dried coffee uh, during your post-crack development, during that caramelization stage of the sugar browning. And that's best aided by a slower ramp up into first crack. Um, so it doesn't take much in my opinion to get a good performance out of these types of coffees. Once you get past first crack, it's really just 15 or 30 seconds, but think about potentially trading that value as in uh, potentially cutting off your roast a little bit um, uh, longer, um, but with a slower, a lower percentage, a lower total time in that after crack development stage. That's the section on moisture content. I wanna talk about my favorite measurement now, which is density. Uh, I think density is really fun. It's also the easiest to measure uh, for a roaster with very little equipment. Um, density is just mass divided by volume. And we think of mass uh, oftentimes as weight. Um, basically it's density is a measurement of how much stuff fits into a given space, right? And for coffee, uh, just think about all the different places that coffee is stored during its journey from origin to roaster and beyond. Uh, any place that coffee needs to take up space, its density is going to matter because its density affects how much of it can fit into that space. Higher density coffees being able to fit more coffee total. I'm sorry, my slideshow appears to be on an auto timer and I apologize. I, 
swore to the roast magazine staff that I this was not my first rodeo and I'm showing some amateur uh, hour here, uh, but bear with me. Uh, uh, coffee uh, of high density fits more of it into, into spaces than low density coffee. Um, and we're gonna use a comparison. We're gonna compare uh, right now the density of water, uh, which in a perfect environment, um, we can assume that in grams and milliliters, water can fit one gram of weight of mass into one milliliter of space. And therefore, water has a density of one gram per milliliter. In coffee, there are two traditional ways that we can do this. Um, and we also heard um, Dr. Luce talk about this as well, um, that uh, one of these methods, which I tend to call free settling, but many folks refer to as bulk density, um, is where you fill up a, a whole bunch of space and measure how much uh, total volume is taken up and the weight that fits in that volume. Um, the more scientifically like accurate measurement would be considered displacement. If any of you recall the story of Archimedes in ancient Greece, where there's this king who receives a gift, it's a crown, and he thinks that maybe it's not authentically gold. And so he tasks Archimedes with like, how do we figure out its true uh, makeup without destroying the thing? Because they didn't want to melt it down if it actually was gold, he wanted to keep it. Archimedes ponders on it for days and can't come up with an answer and decides to uh, take a bath and the bathtub is filled up to the brim. Archimedes steps in and the amount of water displaced by Archimedes' body represents the total volume of Archimedes' body. And Archimedes knows how much he weighs and realizes that he can ascertain density via displacement method and then runs naked through the streets of ancient Greece to tell the king all about his discovery. Um, that's a convenient story that is apparently a myth, uh, but uh, you can do this with coffee too. You can take a graduated cylinder, fill it up with some water and measure how much the water is displaced by uh, coffee beans. It's in my opinion, a difficult measurement for a number of reasons. The first being that uh, you kind of lose your product in the process. The second being that most like prosumer grade materials are not really accurately measuring these uh, metrics at, unless you want to really big scale. So like in a tiny 50 or 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, you're not gonna get an accurate enough uh, volumetric reading. And then the mass, the, the weight might not even be accurate out to the hundredth of a gram in some cases that you'd need to uh, interpret that data. So my suggestion is that if you wanna measure density, you do it by displacement, or sorry, you do it not by displacement, by uh, free settling or bulk density. Um, and the easy way to do this is to take a cup, probably a smallish one, uh, let's say 200 milliliters in capacity might be a nice um, volume to shoot for, you could do less. Uh, weigh how much water it takes to fill to the top uh, of the brim of that glass in milliliters if you can. And ideally, if you know that going into it, it's a 200 milliliter glass, it should fit almost exactly 200 milliliters of water. Then, you know, dump that water, dry it out and weigh how much coffee fits in it, scraping the top off uh, of coffee. And that weight divided by your total volume will give you a density measurement. That's how we take measurements here at the Crown. Uh, we also use a Sinar, which um, is a digital uh, measurement. And I wanted to say that regardless of your methods, if you're consistent, you should be able to get meaningful results. So this is a comparison of the graduated cylinder that we use, which is in green. The orange represents the Sinar cup uh, measured manually. And then the black represents the Sinar cup, the same uh, volume and weights interpreted by the digital metrics inside the Sinar itself. And there are some inconsistencies and across the board, the Sinar's digital readout produces higher numbers. But in every case, the ranking, the order of these densities is the same for these particular copies that were measured, taken three times on each measurement method. And the important takeaway here is that if you are consistent, you should be able to take away important data such as the Yemen coffee in this example has relatively low density, one of the lowest densities on the table, compared to the Kenya and the Colombia, which are much higher. So 
Interpreted another way, got my graph in the wrong place. Here it is. Interpreted another way, uh, you can compare these methods that I use the manual free settled method on the bottom there and the SINARS readouts digital and get rough uh, values for what you might consider about average density and then compare those to higher or lower densities. Okay. Um, trend wise across the globe, we see some common places and processes that might result in higher or lower densities, some things you can kind of make assumptions about. And this is, you know, what we used to do on the roasting floors, just like toss around these ideas of, well, we're roasting a Colombian coffee, let's treat it as if it were higher density in the roaster. Um, but this is stuff that's easy to measure and it's really important and relevant. Um, and I'll explain why momentarily. But um, what we see uh, is a lot of higher density coffees being um, produced and exported from countries in East Africa and Colombia. Higher elevations tend to produce higher density coffees. Um, and the fully washed method often, because it includes extra density sorting as a part of the washing fermenting process, will also tend to produce higher density coffees than a corresponding natural or honey process from the same processing station. Uh, and then low density coffees, um, dry process and wet hold, um, especially wet hold tend to produce very low density coffees, decafs as well. Um, and then countries with lower elevations, such as Brazil, um, Sumatra traditionally doing those, you know, wet hold type coffees. And then strangely, uh, even though the elevations are incredibly high and the bean size relatively small, uh, Yemen frequently in my estimation seems to measure in the lower side of things, which is an interesting anomaly. Um, Let's talk about the significance of density because this is uh, where we really get into why I think that this easy to measure metric is really important for roasters, buyers, um, QC agents, whomever you might be, wherever you are in the supply chain, knowing the density of your green coffee is really relevant, partly because dense coffee takes up less space than not dense coffee. And as a result, that might have an impact on things like the expense of shipping or the number of bags you can fit into a container. The number of bags you measured by weight also affecting how much is shipped. And all of this stuff contributes to the cost of the coffee and the value of the coffee. In an example here, um, we've got a coffee measured at relatively average density, 680 grams per liter on this Ethiopian. And the Sumatran coffee relatively low at 640 grams. That's just a difference of 40 grams in a liter, which doesn't sound like very much, but it's a 6% difference. And ultimately what that means is that I can fit 60 kg of weight into less space with that Ethiopian coffee. And this might explain why you can stuff 320 bags of Ethiopian coffee into a 20 foot container, but only fit 275 or 300 of the Sumatran coffee in the same amount of space. And think about that difference of 25 to 50 bags over the cost of say $5,000 maybe on average or depending on you know where we are in our logistics nightmare, uh, maybe double that in some cases. That's a lot of money to be absorbed over the cost of each pound and it really adds up. There's also an important relationship between moisture content and density, which we just talked about. Green coffee sinks in water, or at least well-sorted green coffee ought to. And uh, the reason for that is because coffee is denser than water before it's roasted. And as a result, coffees that have higher moisture content also tend to have lower densities because there's less coffee stuff taking up the same space inside each bean. And as a result, we kind of treat these coffee, the coffees of like high moisture, um, low density and high density, uh, low moisture as sort of like equal but opposites in a way. Um, you can make a few assumptions uh, about possible moisture issues, even if you're just measuring density, which I think is really interesting and a cost effective way to help you make better buying decisions, make better storage decisions, and I would argue make uh, better roasting decisions. High density coffees, not to be conflated with conductivity, may actually take more heat energy, particularly early in the roast, 
Um, so you're going to see those turnaround temps at lower uh, numbers naturally for high density coffee. And my argument would be to push against that. You're going to want to use more heat for denser coffees, especially during early stages of roasting. Once they get up to temperature, you're going to have a different strategy. Um, and uh, part of that strategy has to do with the fact that you've been pumping a lot of heat into the roasting system fairly early on and less to do with potentially the changing density of coffee as it roasts, particularly once it reaches first crack where it's almost half as dense. Um, and then also, um, you know, having to do really with that heat energy strategy. Um, and so my suggestion is if you do take that first step of using a higher charge temperature, more uh, burner power during your early stages of roasting, that's when we tend to want to kind of back off of those burners um, during our roasting process um, in moderation so that we don't uh, end up with coffee that, uh, you know, in popular parlance crashes on us once we get to first crack because those high density coffees tend to retain that kind of like heat resistance even a little bit after first crack, whereas low density coffees, as you may occasionally notice, even with a lower, longer temperature roasting strategy, have a tendency to run away from us at the end of the roast. I haven't quoted myself exactly there, but you get the point. So um, to demonstrate this, not long ago, I teamed up with Ikawa Roaster and uh, we did a presentation, which you can find the abbreviated, it's like a 10 minute video online that describes a lot of this in more detail took a couple of examples of green coffee, sent it out to like, I think close to a hundred roasters worldwide. And they got to roast using two profiles that I created um, using exhaust temperature as the driver, uh, which is the lower number. And I think a lot of people correspond it to the bean temperature, but it's not exactly that. It's the heat energy that's exiting the system after it's been absorbed by the beans. So it's only giving a partial interpretation here. But the idea is that um, by affecting really just two things, charge temperature and the duration of Maillard reactions, that would be observable color change to first crack is kind of what we call the Maillard reaction. And um, you should read the technically speaking article in an upcoming Roast Magazine article about this because there's some nuance to that interpretation. But as practical pragmatic roasters, looking at this data, looking at the coffee in front of us, it's very easy for us to distinguish time temperature of the change of color and time temperature of first crack. And if we know that those two points are relatively fixed as our sort of like goalposts in a way, then by affecting the duration of Maillard reactions, um, even in increments as little as 20 to 30 seconds, and this profile is a 30 second differential in those two things, um, we can impact the way that flavors uh, develop as roasters based on knowing nothing but density. And I think that that is fascinating. And uh, in this case, we've got a uh, high density roast, the blue profile starts hot, progresses more quickly, um, and preserves things like sweetness and acidity that we love in those high density, oftentimes like bright, zesty washed coffees from East Africa, for example. And then the lower density coffee, in this case, we used an anaerobically processed coffee from Bolivia which benefited from a slower approach early in roasting and a longer duration of those color change reactions resulting in sweeter, more caramelized notes, um, softer, sweeter, fruiter notes, fruitier notes. Usually this produces coffees with slightly lowered acidities, but better sweetness and better fruit flavor development, particularly for those types of coffees that um, would be in different processing methods, whether it's natural honey or any of the innovative processing methods that we see coming out in the last 10 years or so. Um, so really there's a lot to work with here. And I've been talking a lot about processing, but ultimately um, you, I believe, can make this interpretation based on knowing nothing but density. Section three. Water activity, everyone's still with me. I know I've been talking really fast. Uh, <laughs> it's because I got a lot of material and I'm trying to go through it quickly. Um, so water activity is probably the most complex of the three things that we're talking about today. It is the water vapor pressure of anything. Um, basically, it could be described as like how 
much does the water that's contained in our coffee beans want to evaporate or is there absorption pressure the other direction? We uh, compare water vapor pressure in our substance in coffee in this case. We uh, compare that with uh, pure water at room temperature at sea level. Um, and that gives us like a decimal or percentage basically. So uh, we saw um, uh, Dr. Lewis's presentation, her recommendations for water activity in the neighborhood of that like 0.5 measurement. That means that the water in our coffee is absorbing at 50% of the, or is evaporating at 50% of the rate of pure water at room temperature at sea level. We often abbreviate it using that AW with the W in subscript. That's the way you see it expressed often. Um, and here is what I would consider um, a fairly well-regarded range for most coffees. Uh, I would say that coffee in that 55 to 45 range is where I feel really comfortable operating. And generally speaking, I also kind of um, think of water activity in tandem, not quite in parallel, um, but in strong relationship with moisture content in that lower numbers, maybe to me are less problematic, whereas higher numbers are where we really start to see some issues. Um, uh, particularly at that like above 0.6 range or 60% um, is where we start to see coffees fading more rapidly in storage or in transit. And then specifically the um, 0.7 number is where the Specialty Coffee Association has defined the end of specialty coffee uh, at that range partly because that's where we begin to risk some safety issues as the next slide is trying to get me to talk about. Um, uh, we begin to risk microbial growth essentially. So this is a well-established standard in food safety practices dating back to the 1950s where basically moisture content was replaced by water activity as the most important in, um, predictor of stability, of safety, product safety. Um, and basically below that 0.6 number, there's not really any chance of um, coffee or anything else um, uh, allowing for microbial activity to proliferate. Whereas uh, above that 0.7 number is where we start to th see things like molds, fungus, bacteria begin to be more active. And specifically when it relates to coffee, um, there's a pretty specific figure, the mycotoxin, the okra toxin that we have heard some roasters talking about pretty extensively, uh, can proliferate at the 0.78 number and above. We don't really see that very often in roasters warehouses, but we do see it in the field uh, as coffee is coming off the tree and drying. And that's why it's so important for good drying practices before coffee is exported to ensure that the product is safe. Second thing I would suggest that water activity can help us predict is shelf stability. As I mentioned earlier, that 0.6 figure is kind of where I consider a soft limit. And that's generally for coffees that are like, um, as a buyer, I'm working with coffees that might have to cross an ocean. It might take, you know, today it's six or eight weeks from a port in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, uh, if I'm lucky. Last year at this time, it was like six months. Uh, and so considering the time and the kinds of places that coffee is stored in during those, you know, purchase to arrival timeframes, it's in a metal box in a big boat in the middle of the ocean, high humidity environments often in, you know, often cases like sunbaked. It's like, I really would prefer that coffee not to ship that way, but that's the way the trade works. And so I have to do my best to ensure that coffee is set up for success to survive its journey across the ocean. And one of the most important metrics to help me make those decisions is that soft limit of 0.6 on the water activity measurement. If it's above that, my fear is that it's not gonna arrive tasting as good as when it left. Um, if it's a domestic warehouse, that number is a little spongier. I will feel comfortable um, purchasing small quantities of coffee that I can use in say three or four months time at water activity levels that are above that. Um, but really what water activity does in those higher ranges is it creates um, unstable storage conditions, even in good storage environments. And so it reduces your shelf life if you're concerned about 
avoiding flavors like papery cardboard or those other age related types of flavors that we typically associate with coffees that are past their prime. Lastly, the one everyone wants to talk about, the one that's probably the least um, impactful in terms of the way that water activity can um, really affect coffee, but it does in some ways is how it might affect sugar browning. And as alluded to earlier in the moisture section, uh, water activity in green coffee um, may uh, slow early heat absorption, but may actually increase the rate of those Maillard reactions. And that's kind of why we see that um, potential takeoff in mid Maillard reaction with those wetter coffees is because wetter coffees tend to have higher water activities. Um, and in a lot of cases, it also means that we may have higher temperatures um, at first crack and possibly even beyond. Um, so coloration and the Maillard reaction um, and caramelization are all impacted by water activity. And um, the studies that I've read tend to indicate that the higher the water activity is, the more rapid color development will happen during late stage Maillard and caramelization. And that is important for us as roasters because if we're dealing with coffees that have higher water activities, then we need to know if we're using color measurements as a metric, as a part of our QC systems in our roasteries, that that water activity is gonna impact the way that we get to our color. And being careful if we're trying to be on the lighter side or watching and waiting if we're looking for darker roasted coffees. In either case, water activity can impact um, the rate of coloration. And lastly, based on some informal uh, data gathered, uh, it's possible, I say this, you know, with caution, but I, th I think that it's possible that higher water activity coffees may retain um, characteristics that we uh, interpret as perceived acidity, uh, regardless of roast level in some cases, whereas with lower water activity coffees, it's a lot easier to manipulate that perception of acidity. But if you have a high water, high water activity coffee that has high perceived acidity at light roasts, it probably will also have a higher perceived acidity taken darker, taken slower in your roaster. Whereas if your water activity is generally speaking a little bit lower, then you've got more room to manipulate that particular flavor variable as a roaster with your techniques. Okay, to demonstrate that coloration, um, I ran a couple of tests with uh, coffees from the same origin. Basically I exposed some coffee to a high humidity environment for a limited amount of time and uh, increased its water activity. Um, even after they were dried to the same moisture content, the coffee that had an unstable storage environment exhibited a similar unstable uh, water activity measurement, um, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, and you know, maybe lends itself to an argument of store your coffee in places that don't fluctuate temperatures and humidity if possible. But the takeaway from this is that roasted at different uh, lengths, different uh, lengths of roast, uh, the coffee with the higher water activity had dramatic and predictable coloration differentials um, based on long, short, and the control, the average um, roast length. Whereas that lower water activity coffee responded with less predictability. Um, we can see those longer roasts didn't actually result in darker exterior bean colors. Um, and also, uh, smaller differential overall um, in terms of coloration. Those are color track numbers uh, that you're seeing there, exterior bean numbers. Um, water activity is an expensive measurement um, because the equipment needed is um, pretty pricey. Um, and I would encourage you, if you can't afford or don't wish to invest in a meter yourself, if there are copies that you might be concerned about, many importers that you're purchasing from are, are often able to take that measurement. And the suggestion should be that they also should be willing to share those measurements if they're transparent. Um, and I think that that can tell you a lot about like, if you find a coffee that tastes delicious, but you're concerned about its shelf life, that's the difference between buying a pallet's worth and buying a bag or two. 
um, and then resampling before you make your next purchase. Uh, it, for me, it's often an inventory strategy decision before it becomes a roasting decision. Um, and that's the way that I'd encourage you to think about it too. Safety first, and then your storage and an inventory strategies. And lastly, yeah, it might impact coloration. Okay, uh, I haven't been watching the clock. I hope I'm doing okay on time. Um, I wanted to um, just kind of tease a little bit of new research that I'm working on um, that correlates density and processing type and tries to explain maybe not the whys, but at least the what and the hows of coffees that seem to perform strangely after first crack. And a lot of us um, might be used to talking about these in popularized terms like flick and crash. I like to think of coffees that accelerate rapidly after first crack versus coffees that sort of flatline in terms of the temperature profile. But however you wanna talk about it, we've been speaking about these coffees for a long time without really, I think, understanding exactly why um, they might perform like this. And in a lot of cases, it's like you can do everything right as a roaster approaching first crack and still find that coffees will have a tendency one way or the other. And, you know, regardless of your roasting type in many cases. And oftentimes, you know, we've been finding that washed coffees, like I said, have a tendency to kind of slope downwards on that differential or rate of rise. Whereas natural coffees, very frequently have a tendency to kind of run away from us. And I am starting to consider the possibility that that might be the result in density changes and the difference in the way that density changes from green to roasted beginning at or around first crack. And the thought is here that lower density, uh, sorry, excuse me, natural process coffees um, are losing density more rapidly uh, as they get into first crack. I've talked with Rob Hoos about this a little bit. His interpretation is slightly different and I have some exploration to do still. So this is work in progress. Um, he suggested that moisture content and particularly moisture development during the Maillard reaction might also be responsible for this. So there's unanswered questions here, but what I can tell you is that I, I think there's some interesting possibilities, um, again, for that density metric that's something that I find so valuable as a roaster and really encourage you, if you're not um, already taking density measurements, start thinking about that as a, a way to consider roasting strategies to get better tasting coffees.